Um, welcome to today's Grand Rounds. My name is Christine Denny, and I am one of the Grand Rounds Committee co-directors, along with Drs. Kate Elkington and Jeff Miller. And today I am joined by Dr. Jeff Miller in co-moderating this lecture on Zoom. We have a few announcements before we begin. Uh, next week's Grand Rounds will be given by Dr. Jay Savellius, Professor of Medical Psychology in Psychiatry here at CUMIC. The title of their talk is Gender Affirmation, an Intersectional Framework Informing Intervention Science to Promote Transgender Health. It will be an in-person lecture, so please join us in the Hellman Auditorium if you are able to. The session will be followed by a lunch for in-person attendees. For today, I encourage everyone attending via Zoom webinar to post questions at any time during the talk using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. This is separate from the chat. If you are a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question as we will prioritize trainee questions. Please also write, can ask question myself or prefer to have my question read at the end of your question. If you are willing to ask your question yourself, Jeff will temporarily promote you to panelists so you can ask your question directly to our speaker. Asking your question yourself helps uh, promote a sense of connection during our Zoom sessions. I'm now going to turn over uh, the Grand Rounds to Dr. Laura Muffson, who will speak about the Viola Bernard Grand Rounds Endowed Lecture and introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Zoom and in person. Um, uh, before I introduce Dr. Godinho today, our Viola Bernard Grand, Grand Round speaker, I want to provide a little background on Dr. Bernard. <clears throat> Dr. Bernard was a prominent New York psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who was on the faculty at Columbia for five decades. Throughout her professional life, she worked to expand the application of psychoanalytic theory to study and address social problems that she saw as negatively impacting mental health. She was ahead of her time with her focus on the social determinants of health. She founded the Division of Community and Social Psychiatry at Columbia and directed it from 1956 to 1969. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was committed to understanding the needs and problems of children who were suffering due to poverty or other social and community factors. Along with that came a commitment to increasing access to mental health care for children and families living in underserved or disadvantaged communities. She established the country's first low-cost psychoanalytic clinic at Columbia as part of her campaign to make mental health services much more widely available. In 2016, the Viola W. Bernard Foundation made a generous gift to establish the Viola W. Bernard Endowment Fund, which supports a yearly Grand Rounds presentation, as well as training and evidence-based treatments for children and families. I am honored today to introduce Dr. Omar Godinho as our Viola Bernard Grand Rounds speaker. As you will hear, his work embodies the same mission and goals of Dr. Bernard. Dr. Gadinho is an associate professor and director of the Clinical Child Psychology Program at the University of Kansas. He received both his undergraduate and his PhD in clinical psychology at UCLA. He then ventured to the East Coast <clears throat> to complete his pre-doctoral clinical psychology internship in child and adolescent psychology at NYU Child Study Center Bellevue Hospital. He stated as... <clears throat> He stayed at NYU as an NIMH T32 postdoctoral fellow, and he also held the position of clinical assistant professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at NYU before leaving to join the faculty at the Department of Psychology at the University of Denver as an assistant professor where he remained until 2018 when he joined the clinical child psychology program at the University of Kansas as associate professor. In 2022, Dr. Godinho was named director of the clinical psychology program there, which I learned is one of the only freestanding uh, clinical child psychology programs, I think, in the country. At the University of Kansas, Dr. Godinho directs the ASSESO, Advancing Care Through Community Engagement Services and Outcomes Research Research Group, which seeks to develop and disseminate clinical practices and service delivery models that are grounded in the latest scientific research that can be feasibly delivered in challenging clinical settings 
and that are well in line with the values and preferences of youth and families who receive the services. Dr. Gadino's research focuses specifically on children from immigrant Latino families and examines individual cultural and community influences on youth adjustment. He's published numerous articles focusing on improving access and service use among minoritized and marginalized youth, including Black and Latinx youth, as well as justice-involved youth. He's also an expert in the delivery of CBT in real-world settings, such as schools, juvenile justice, community mental health, with diverse populations. He is also associate editor of the Journal of Latinx Psychology and the Journal of Traumatic Stress. He's past president of the American Board of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology and a fellow of the American Psychological Association Society for Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology. He's the recipient of several awards, including the Judy E. Hall Early Career Psychologist Award from the National Register of Health Service Psychologists in 2016, <clears throat> and the American Board of Psychology, Professional Psychology Early Career Psychologist Service Award in 2019. I know I am eager to hear his talk titled Disparities in Mental Health Service Use of Latinx Youth, identifying and responding to youth and family needs. And I will turn it over to Dr. Gadino now. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. It's an honor to be here with you today. Um, and uh, in particular, it's an honor to be here on a day where we uh, celebrate the legacy of Dr. Viola Bernard. Um, uh, her, her work is fantastic and it's an honor to be here um, uh, helping us remember her legacy. Um, before I get started, I, I want to quickly, uh, quickly mention two things. Uh, one, I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose, uh, but I did want to talk a little bit about the perspective that I bring to, to my work. Um, I'm the child of immigrants from Mexico. I grew up in an under-resourced neighborhood in Los Angeles uh, where I got to see lots of disparities firsthand, uh, but I also want to highlight that I saw lots of cultural and community strengths, um, and it's that perspective that I bring to my work so even though today I'm focused primarily on disparities, um, there is the part of my work that really looks at cultural strengths and resilience um, of, of these wonderful uh, kids, families, and communities uh, living in immigrant neighborhoods. So to get us started, I want us to think about a hypothetical client that we'll call Miguel. Miguel is a 12-year-old Latino male in seventh grade. As a young child, he was, uh, experienced emotional abuse at the hands of his father, witnessed domestic violence. His father left the home when he was seven, and since then, him and his mother have experienced housing instability. He lives in a neighborhood with high rates of community violence. He recently witnessed a shooting in a park nearby. And teachers are concerned about Miguel's behavior, and the school has mentioned to the parents that they're not sure that the school can meet his needs. So even though this is a hypothetical uh, client, uh, very familiar to many of us, in terms of the kinds of complex issues that present in our clinical work. And we might ask ourselves, how is it that Miguel is going to receive services if he is? What's going to drive those services? What's going to get in the way? And that's what I really want us to, to be focused on for today. So we know that disparities exist, and, and I think of that as the what. We've, we've long known that there's racial and ethnic disparities in access to services for uh, children and adolescents. But the important questions to me are really the, the why and the how, that without these two important pieces, it's really challenging to, to know what to do about those disparities. And we can have lots of work documenting the fact that they exist, uh, but it, it, it really prevents us from being able to, to target those disparities. So the learning objectives for today, we hope that by the end of this conversation, we'll be uh, able to describe what patterns of mental health service use look like for Latinx youth, and uh, that we'll be able to think about those factors that are associated with unmet mental health needs for kids, and that we'll be able to think about how we approach assessment and engagement uh, in a way where we try to address unmet internalizing mental health needs in Latinx youth. So starting with barriers to care, again, uh, much, of, much of the research that really looks at disparities starts by thinking about barriers. And I want us to think about what's the evidence for these barriers? How do we see these barriers in our day-to-day -day practice? 
So these statistics are not, are not new to, to, to most of you. Um, we know that about one in five children and adolescents in the US has a mental health disorder and that yet 80% of those children will not receive mental health services. And while that's a striking statistic that unfortunately has been around for, for much too long, we also know that racial and ethnic disparities exist uh, even beyond that, where Latinx, Black youth, and uh, Asian and Pacific Islander youth, relative to white youth, are less likely to receive mental health services, experience greater delays in terms of accessing services, and they report greater access problems. And there's been lots of work documenting that these aren't due to, to uh, real differences in, in need or severity or impairment, that these are bona fide differences uh, as a function of race and ethnicity. And, and we first highlighted these right around 2001 with the Surgeon General's uh, supplement on culture, uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, and the, for the few years that followed that, um, LeCook and colleagues looked at these, these data at, to look at those trajectories of service use uh, in, in the years following this, this uh, landmark uh, report. Um, and here they looked at data for medical expenditures, a panel survey data looking at about 30,000 youth, ages five to 21. And unfortunately, they find that those disparities continued for those next five years. And really importantly, that youth that had mental health needs during those first two years of the study, about 10% of white youth initiated services at any point beyond that. And the rate was half as much for Black youth and Latinx youth. Now, importantly, they also noticed that once, uh, once children received services, they didn't really see uh, those racial and ethnic disparities in terms of the expenditures. So this isn't, this isn't perfect data, and it's not really speaking to the quality of care, but it really helps us think about the importance of initiating services, that that's really one place where we can really target our energies. And when we think about initiating services in the world of child and adolescent uh, psychology and psychiatry, we think about the role of gatekeepers. Who is it that helps youth be linked to services? And in most cases, we're talking about those adults. Those adults uh, are, are the one that facilitate referrals, that identify needs. And thankfully, youth have access to multiple gatekeepers in their day-to-day -day lives, whether it's pediatricians, teachers, uh, school counselors, for example. And that as we think about these barriers to care, that we really wanna be thinking about barriers at the gatekeeper level as well. What's gonna make those gatekeepers, those adults in the child's life, more or less likely to uh, access, or to, to um, muster resources to connect that child to needed services. And that we wanna think about these disparities as, as existing at this intersection between what's happening at the family, the community, and at a, at a more global systemic level. Now, thankfully, there's been uh, lots of work looking at uh, how disparities happen in terms of mental health outcomes. And there's important work by Dr. Margarita Alegria, uh, commissioned by the WT Grant Foundation, really thinking about developing models for how do we understand uh, the existence of, of disparities in mental health problems. And, and they identified, synthesized the literature and identified these important factors that we can look to as being important drivers of those disparities. Things like low socioeconomic status, obviously childhood adversity, family structure, and neighborhood level factors. Um, and the importance of having a model like this is that it really then can guide us into thinking about how to intervene. Right, that if we have a framework for understanding how disparities can happen, we can then do something about that. And unfortunately, that really hasn't existed for mental health disparities in service use. It does for um, uh, mental health outcomes, not so much for service use patterns. And some of our, our early work right now is looking at developing such a model. Um, I'll talk more about this study uh, a little bit later on, but this is work that we conducted when I was still in Colorado. Um, and it was working with different stakeholders uh, around three different counties, mostly working in community mental health centers. So looking at providers in those settings, uh, talking with uh, Latinx families that had access services for their children, and also talking with Latinx families that had never had any contact with the mental health service system. So using focus groups uh, methodology to understand what gets in the way, what kinds of barriers these families experience to develop or at least start to develop a model for uh, the way to think about barriers. And, and what we find in that data is that these barriers really fall into three broader categories, that there's obviously things happening at a societal level, things happening at the mental health system level, and then what we typically focus on in most work is what's happening at the family level. So it's a way for us to really think about broadly 
How do we start to think about barriers happening at multiple levels? And that that's gonna, in theory, help us be able to, to, to respond to those, um, uh, to respond to needs and to really think about where can we have the most uh, effect given our role with these families, given where we're connected. Is it uh, working directly with families, working within mental health systems, or at a broader societal level? So at the societal level, not surprisingly, we identified things like low, low socioeconomic status and, and the, the incredible burden that families face uh, generally across their day-to-day -day experiences and how these impact access to services. Families also talked about systemic racism and discrimination and, and their experience uh, that, that these settings are really not set up for them or they don't feel like these are places that are designed to be responsive to their needs. And then importantly, also thinking about the representation of ethnic minorities within the mental health field. They talked about things like um, access to higher education, uh, to licensing requirements, and to really being able to, to have a workforce that reflects the communities that they serve. Importantly, we also thought about what's happening at the mental health system level. And, and here, uh, again, providers, agency directors, administrators really talked about limited funding, um, how there's really low, um, uh, there aren't many resources available to these agencies to really think about innovative ways to really target access for certain populations. They also talked about things like siloed systems where we have very little interaction between schools and community mental health or primary care. They talked about limited agency capacity, where many agencies are so overwhelmed that there's very little room uh, or resources left to really develop new programs or new ways to engage uh, communities that have yet to be engaged. They talked about bureaucratic process barriers, things that make uh, the, uh, the process of accessing services much more burdensome than it needs to be. And then they talked about things like the lack of culturally competent services and the lack of service providers that can deliver services in Spanish for the families that, that require that. And then at the family level, we talked about the, again, the practical barriers that most of us are familiar with, things like childcare, transportation, cost and finances. So nothing really surprising in, in, in this part of, of, of the analysis, um, except that families also talked about uh, cost and burdens that we often don't think about. So even those families with insurance talked about things like co-pays, talked about things like parking and transportation, and then talked about things like the, the, the perceived burden of having what, what seems to them like open-ended uh, services, that to them this may be a small co-pay, but they're not quite sure how long this is going to have to go, uh, to go on for. And then in contrast to these practical barriers, we also think about things like attitudes, beliefs, and perceptions. And here they talked about things like families having a really high threshold for when they believe services are needed. That there's often competing demands for families and that it's really hard to prioritize this one need in the face of so many other needs. Sometimes they talked about things like someone in the family being explicitly opposed to the child receiving mental health services, whether this is a grandparent or, or, or another caregiver. He talked about provider client discomfort, that sometimes it's the sense of, I don't feel like this is the right provider for me. And sometimes perceptions that the provider didn't feel comfortable with them. And then obviously things that we've, we know a lot about like stigma, um, lack of information about accessing services or what's available. So again, these aren't necessarily groundbreaking barriers, but it's, it's an initial step for us to be thinking about a framework for then understanding where we can start to intervene. And, and thankfully, there's been more recent work in the last couple of years really thinking about how we start to look at some of our, our um, foundational models in our work and start to approach them from, a, from an anti-racist perspective, to really think about how these models really need to be adapted and expanded um, and modified to really think about correctly or, or effectively addressing the needs of minoritized youth. And this is just one example, uh, it's, it's uh, work from Jessica Stern, um, trying to re-envision ecological systems theory and say, how do we think about something like ecological systems theory, where we think about children within these broader contexts and really center the experiences of black children? What are ways for us to really think about the intersections between foster care, juvenile justice and school systems? to think about public policies and colorism, to also balance that out with cultural strengths, and to think about what's happening broadly within the world. So we hope that in the next couple of years, we'll be able to really finalize this, um, uh, to, to have more um, access to theoretical models and, and practical frameworks that really help us understand uh, 
ways to organize and ways to understand barriers that's going to hopefully eventually uh, allow us to leverage um, uh, interventions to really dismantle disparities. So that's one broad piece where our work starts is really thinking about how we organize and understand service access and barriers themselves. But within this broader context of, of barriers, we also know that there's differences in terms of patterns of how youth access services. And there are many places in, in our systems where kids are overrepresented. And it really forces us to think about how, how are these patterns, how, how, uh, how do these patterns come to be? It's not just the case that, that ethnic minority youth have uh, less access across the board. How do we understand these differential patterns of, of service use? And some of our early work is try to look at these questions as a function of problem type. How do we think about internalizing problems like anxiety, depression, somatic complaints, and externalizing problems like oppositionality, uh, aggression? How do we think about these as being potential drivers that intersect with race and ethnicity to help us understand patterns of service use and lack of service use? So these were data collected as part of the Patterns of Care study in San Diego County, about 1,000 children ages 11 to 18. And these are families that were well known to a public service sector. So the, the family was known to juvenile justice, child welfare, uh, specialty mental health, special education services. So this was a, a, um, a wonderful sample to really understand, uh, to follow for the next couple of years to really understand patterns through and in, uh, into and through the, the mental health service system. So here we look at these two year longitudinal outcomes. Uh, and again, with a focus on how might problem type internalizing and externalizing help us understand some of these differential patterns. And what we find is probably not surprising to those of you that, that work clinically with youth, um, but it, at, at the time it really helped us start to develop this idea about uh, uh, examining patterns of service use more closely. See if I can get the highlighter to work. Here we go. So what we see is that uh, youth with internalizing problems, so anxiety, depression, uh, somatic complaints, that youth who had internalizing problems, that this is really where we saw disparities in uh, uh, racial and ethnic disparities in terms of the, the likelihood of using specialty mental health services in those next two years, with white youth having the highest rates of use, followed by black youth, followed by Latinx youth, and down here we have Asian Pacific Islander youth. So this is really where we see disparities as a function of race and ethnicities, and we're looking at, at those children that have internalizing mental health needs. When we switch to children that have externalizing mental health needs, here we see fewer disparities, although Asian and Pacific Islander youth continue to have the lowest rates of service use. And then when we look at youth that had both types of problems, there we really don't see uh, racial and ethnic disparities, and what we do see is, is African American youth being much more likely to receive services in those cases. So some initial early work helping us really think about how might problem type and how we perceive uh, somebody's behavior um, influence the likelihood of somebody receiving services. And again, this was informed by our thinking about places where youth are overrepresented, places like juvenile justice, child welfare, uh, special ed, where we uh, have early research looking at um, biases and how we perceive the behavior of black children, for example, and how this might really amplify our attention to externalizing problems. And again, might encourage uh, gatekeepers within that child's life to be really attuned to mental health needs and to really facilitate those referrals. But yet there's something that's happening that's really creating those disparities for those that have internalizing mental health needs. Those kinds of problems that may or may not be impacting the, the adults around them, or they may or may not be as noticeable the adults around them. We took this one step further and wanted to look at just uh, the Hispanic and, and uh, Latinx, Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander youth uh, within this study. So a subsample of 465. And here you wanted to look at what might be happening at the level of the caregivers. So there's this idea of, of dis, uh, adult distress thresholds. Um, the idea being that, that adults really adult in their culture sets the stage for when a problem is, is deemed to be a problem or how problematic it is. Um, so the idea here is that youth um, from uh, immigrant families, that we expected that families that are more traditional and had traditional cultural values might be especially um, 
uh, might see uh, conduct problems and externalizing behaviors as especially problematic, and that the flip side might be true for those that are that are less acculturated non-immigrant families. That in these cases, families might be more attuned to uh, internalizing mental health needs. So our hypothesis here is that, but again, that, that that when we just looked at ethnic minority youth, Latinx and Asian Asian youth, um, that problem type would now potentially uh, uh, vary as a function of whether the family was an immigrant family or non-immigrant family. And we found what you might expect, things like insurance obviously predicted the uh, likelihood of accessing, uh, receiving services in, in those next two years, um, that the Latinx youth were more likely than the Asian Pacific Islander youth to receive services overall, and that only externalizing problems seemed to predict service use in those next two years. But we also found that that was dependent on whether the family, uh, the caregivers are US born or, or not. And here what we found was this opposite pattern, whereas we look at those youth, again, with internalizing mental health needs, when the caregivers were US born, they were much more likely to receive services relative to when they became from immigrant families. And we see the opposite pattern with externalizing problems where the immigrant, the children from Im uh, immigrant families are much more likely to receive services uh, than children from US born families. And again, this is looking only within those minoritized communities. Now, more recently, one of my grad students has started to look at, at following this up and really thinking about what's the link or what, what's the effect of acculturation itself. So thinking about the, the degree to which caregivers are acculturated to US culture. Um, this slide is a little bit confusing, so I'll, I'll walk us through uh, what I think are the important parts. So again, these are youth that are known to public health service, uh, public service systems. So there's a higher likelihood of, of service use here overall. And what you see in this yellow line is the mean overall rates of mental health service use, right around 42%. What we then looked at is a model where, we, where we're looking at all of these predictors of service use, including problem type. And what we did is saying, if, if you look at only isolating the effects of internalizing need, so those children that have internalizing mental health problems are here on the left, those without internalizing problems, everything else in that model held at the average level or here on the right. And the really interesting piece to us is that we're saying that there's this disparity here where uh, these are just Latinx youth, that those with internalizing need, they're actually much less likely than the overall average to receive mental health services. What you'll see here is, is the parent's level of acculturation. So very unlikely to receive services here when the parents have low levels of acculturation. And it's only at the highest levels of parent acculturation that youth, Latinx youth with internalizing needs uh, are even close to the average. So again, one way for us to really be thinking about what is it about internalizing problems specifically that, incre that, that creates um, uh, even higher or more pronounced disparities than, than we might see when looking at overall service use. So this has led us to really think about how, how are needs identified? How is it that we, uh, that we determine when a child needs services, what types of services they need? So we're looking at this idea of differential patterns and saying, how might this be related to the identification of needs? And here we go back to this work that I mentioned very briefly uh, at the beginning, where we're trying to leverage stakeholder perspectives to really think about working with these Latinx families, again, families that somehow have been connected to services that they provide a really important and unique perspective, right? They've overcome the barriers, they've accessed services and they've, they've uh, uh, remained with those services so that we can recruit them. So looking at those Latinx families, looking at Latinx families that have never had any contact with mental health services. And then again, looking at providers, agency directors, managers. And this is a mixed method study with our partners at the Colorado Department of, of uh, Colorado Office of Behavioral Health, um, where we use survey methods to understand uh, and examine perceptions about barriers, and also use some experimental vignettes um, to understand things like perceptions of severity, perceptions of need, and, and whether mental health services would or wouldn't be appropriate. So I want to talk a little bit about some of this work that that is um, uh, hot off the presses, where we're really thinking about um, examining pieces that help us get at this idea of uh, identification of need. And, and two pieces that I'll be talking about today are, are the work that we did with these experimental vignettes, 
These are vignettes that were developed already by other researchers. And what we did is we took one that, that describes a, a child with internalizing mental health needs. They're really talking about depression and one that's talking about externalizing needs, uh, aggression at school and some inattention. And both of these were calibrated in the process that, that, that they were developed to be of, of moderate severity. And these different stakeholder groups can then look at providing ratings of how serious they believe that, that problem to be, how impairing they believe it's gonna be, um, and the child's, the, their perception of the child needing services, all using a one to 10 scale. So that was the, the vignette work that I'll talk about briefly. Um, and then the other piece of this was a semi-structured focus group, where we really, uh, the parts that we'll be talking about today, we really uh, dug into the idea of how is it that Latinx families identify mental health needs? Um, and we also ha had them discuss those vignettes that they read. How was it that, that those vignettes, what was it about that content that really stood out to them? How would they approach that information and really think through whether a child needed or didn't need mental health services? Uh, we used a community engaged approach here where we worked with three different counties in the state of Colorado. Um, we provided meals, um, uh, questionnaires, and then that focus group, that was the, the, the order of events. Um, families received a small incentive for their time, family meals, and we also provided childcare. And I wanna briefly talk about two pieces um, of, of, of this work. Uh, one where we looked at a directed content analysis to understand again, how, how families identify mental health needs in Latinx youth. Um, and then so, uh, our analysis of these vignette ratings. So starting with the vignette ratings briefly, um, when families, again, well, I'll, I'll orient this to, to this slide here. Um, in the yellow, we have provider ratings. Then we have in the orange, the ratings of families that are receiving services currently. And then in this brown color, we have the families that are not and have never had contact with services. So one of the first things we found here is that providers rate externalizing behaviors as being less serious relative to what caregivers see. And providers here also rate externalizing problems as less serious than internalizing problems. So maybe not surprising there, but families see the externalizing problems as being more serious and providers tend to have a different perspective where they see the internalizing problems as being much more serious. When we looked at things like perceptions of family impairment, um, the only difference here was here where the families in services and not in services saw externalizing problems as more likely to be impairing for the family or as having a higher level of impact on that family. And then when you think about perceptions of, of whether somebody needs mental health services, that here, interestingly, families um, rated both types of problems as, as equally likely to require mental health services. And I'll, I'll come back to this in some of our qualitative data. But the providers saw the internalizing problems as being more likely to require mental health services than the externalizing problems. So these are just some uh, quick data points to really highlight the fact that providers and families are approaching the problem from very different perspectives sometimes. And that that's gonna potentially set the stage for challenges with identifying the problem and engaging families and services that we're starting from very different perspectives at times, uh, thinking about what the problem is, how we understand it, what we call it. In our quality of data, we started to again, think about um, having families and providers talk about how needs are identified. And we found that about a third of these references, so about 33% of references to how families identify um, needs within all of these groups, really focused on the fact that there's forces outside of the family, external sources that are really responsible for driving mental health service use or the, initi the, the in initiation of services for kids. That primarily they reference things like school personnel, health providers, um, other adults and extended family. But that about a third of these families are really thinking about the importance of somebody outside of the family facilitating the identification of problems and the connection to services. Now here I'm presenting data from all of the groups combined. There were very few uh, differences to note, but one important difference was that those families that had never received services or had contact with mental health service systems before, uh, they contributed very little to, to, to this category. To them, they assumed that, that the family would just identify it themselves. And it was really those families with experience 
with mental health services and the providers that recognize the importance of sources outside of the family for helping uh, identify and connect kids, uh, identify needs and connect kids to needed services. About half of the references here, so um, half of uh, uh, all mentions of how needs get identified, really focused on this category we called aspects of the mental health problem. And here we see the totals across the entire groups. These are the separate percentages just for providers and managers, for families in services, and for families not in services. I'm going to walk you through some parts of this, uh, of this, of this graph. Um, that, that I think are the, the, the most important, um, but I'm happy to talk about other parts as well. But one thing we started to think about these references to the type of problem, that sometimes families are talking explicitly about internalizing symptoms or what we could code as internalizing symptoms. Sometimes they were talking about externalizing symptoms. Sometimes they're really talking about behaviors that are really impossible for us to code. Uh, I'll have an example of this here. Uh, things like not talking to parents or things like she started wearing black and she started listening to bad music. That these are the kinds of things parents or providers might notice that aren't easily classified as mental health symptoms. And then one really interesting thing for us is that, especially on the provider side, they really talked about this problem type contrast category that we identified where they're really thinking about the, uh, uh, really balancing that perception of internalizing and externalizing needs. So these are cases where, again, these are primarily the providers were specifically mentioning internalizing relative to externalizing problems in how families think about identifying needs. So one example of that is, you know, I see a large focus on behaviors, most, more so than on possible underlying causes. Things like he's not paying attention in school and he's disobeying parents or he's yelling more, then maybe there's some anxiety. And again, this primarily came from providers, but the sense of, of them really thinking about this contrast between the kinds of mental health problems that somebody might present with and how that might drive the parents or the schools um, um, or, or the caregivers in their child's life to really think about identifying this as a possible mental health issue. The other pieces that they talked about here were obviously things like impairment and distress, or we expected an impairment and distress category. Across the board, they really talked about impacts on school and impacts on families. So perhaps again, not surprising when we're thinking about gatekeepers being critical for linking kids to service use. But one thing that was surprising for us is that nobody mentioned distress of the youth themselves. Now I expect this might've been different if we'd had a group of adolescents or a group of kids that we talked to, but that when looking at that gatekeeper level, that the focus is really on how, is, how are things impacting the family or impacting school. They also talked about things like severity of the problem. And here they really thought about the need for things to get worse over time, that the longer something had been there and the worse it was getting, the more likely families were to identify it. And there was a specific sub theme here where they talked about things like self-harm. Now, before I mentioned that I was gonna address one point where the, the provider, where the caregivers had rated internalizing and externalizing problems as equally serious in, in the previous vignette data, what we learned from talking to them is that they, they said the internalizing problems were serious because they might lead to things like self-harm. So they were thinking about those as potential precursors to something more severe. But they were really thinking about internalizing problems at a much more severe level being equivalent to externalizing problems. And again, not surprising to those of you that work clinically, that precipitating stressors were a really important category as well, particularly for families that are receiving services. So they really talked about something happening in this child's life, and that's what led them to access services. It was less about the presentation or the clinical characteristics and more about this thing happened. A family member was deported, uh, somebody got divorced, or, was a, a, or, or there was some other traumatic experience. So looking at the stakeholder data, there's, there's this important need to think about how do we balance or how do we reconcile these data across the, quali the qualitative and the quantitative? That as we think about families and then when they look at those externalizing problem vignettes, that they see them as being much more serious and as being much more likely to have an impact on the family and that we have this potential disconnect with providers where they see the internalizing problems as being more serious and more, uh, uh, more indicative of requiring mental health services. So this disconnect between how uh, parents and providers, uh, caregivers and providers 
um, might perceive the problem uh, at, at baseline. And then as we think about what is influencing or driving those, those perceptions of need, that we identified again, those external, external sources uh, that are really important to consider who, who are the gatekeepers in, in this child's life, the type of problem, uh, the impact on school and family, things like severity and self-harm, and also the importance of precipitating stressors. So as we step back and think about, you know, what, what is next with this work, right? That the idea is that we really need an increased understanding of how kids with mental health need are connected to mental health services. That for most of us, we're looking at a very small slice of the puzzle where it's really just those families that, that have reached out and have been referred. Um, and, and sometimes we don't really spend the time really thinking about what was that pathway that got them there. So really the need to think about uh, identifying youth needs within this broader context of multiple service systems. And with an explicit focus on how families that are seeking services came to seek them. Where was the problem identified? How is it framed? How are they understanding it? What makes it a mental health problem from their perspective? And that there's also a really important role here for, for possible education, really thinking about how we understand children's mental health needs. And that for us, it was a really important opportunity to, to think about uh, redefining how we think of need. Again, we started with this interest in problem type, but families very quickly reminded us that they think about needs much more broadly than, than, than categories of symptoms. The importance of helping adults within a child's life and providers really think about the potential role for youth distress, right? Thinking about this as, a, as a, an important driver of need um, that may or may not be recognized, at least according to today's data. The importance of thinking about who outside of the family can be an ally and, and a potential uh, source of support in identifying and connecting kids uh, to needed services. And then a need for us to, especially within the Latinx community, think about emphasizing internalizing problems at a moderate level, right? How do we understand uh, anxiety, depression, somatic complaints as, as uh, problems that also require attention even at moderate levels, that even beyond, uh, before they might uh, be closely predictive with self-harm, that we might also think about what, what does need to look like at those more moderate levels so that providers, family, schools, uh, uh, pediatricians can be really attuned to what those look like. So that brings us to thinking about what's the role of the provider? That at a basic level, we have this responsibility to, to be aware and to understand the cultural and the social context. That again, we wanna really be thoughtful about how is it that this child came to be connected with services? What was that pathway? What were those referral sources? Who identified the problem? And how did they frame that problem? That there's a really important role here for comprehensive assessment, not just of mental health needs, importantly mental health needs, but also barriers. What has gotten in the way before, what may get in the way going forward. And that there's this important role for a social justice perspective for us to really be thinking about how we think about connecting kids to, uh, to effective services, regardless of race and ethnicity, regardless of the, the, the initial referral source or the problem type. So if there's a place really here for thinking about comprehensive and systematic assessment. Um, I still believe uh, very strongly in the promise of evidence-based assessment, even though there's lots of challenges. And I'm happy to think more about how does one implement uh, um, evidence-based assessment within challenging real world settings. And that maybe we're not talking about doing structured interviews with everybody, but that we really wanna think about being systematic and making sure that we're, we're covering a, a broad range of possible problems Again, because youth might be referred for very specific reasons that may or may not reflect the entirety of their needs. That we also wanna be thinking about what are some of these uh, systemic influences that influence our, our assessment processes and procedural differences. These are things like for, for any of you that work with Spanish speaking families, you might notice that your intakes sometimes take a lot longer. Or if you're working with a translator, or if you don't have half your measures available in Spanish, that all of a sudden your intake looks really, really different you have less information to work with. And to what extent is that leading to some of our difficulties, uh, understanding, um, formulating, and then addressing those difficulties? So really that connection between assessment and formulation becomes really, really critical. Now, now fortunately, you're one of the best places in the world to really be thinking about formulation, 
uh, your colleagues here uh, are the, obviously the developers and, and have been very involved in understanding this cultural formulation interview. Um, and, and one of the, the pieces that's really critical is this focus on defining the problem. If you've ever used the CFI before, it really starts with helping us understand how does this family define the problem? What's their definition, their cultural definition of the problem? What do they think causes it? What maintains it? What's gonna make it better? Now, again, you're at, a, a, at the best place in the world to be thinking about the CFI, but when I do trainings, I'm often surprised at how few uh, providers out there know, know that it's at the back of the DSM. Um, the important part is that they love it. So once they know it's there, they think it's a really useful tool. But to, to really remind us that we already have some tools developed, again, by your, your very own colleagues, that get us on this way to really be thinking about understanding and conceptualizing and defining problems from a cultural perspective. Now, what I want us to be thinking about then is how we move on from this assessment, uh, this initial assessment to start to think about engagement, right? How do, we, how do we have families come back for that next session? And in the work of Lillian Comastia, she talks a lot about the importance of telling stories. She talks about engagement as really being a process of developing a narrative. How do we construct meaning and really understand what this is, what we call it, why it's important, that we do that through developing these narratives. And that at the same time, storytelling is a way to give families voice, right? That it's their way to really help us understand what they're seeing and what's distressing to them. So really thinking about not just the importance of, of um, uh, uh, having families tell you their story for the, for the purpose of report building, but really as a way to understand their cultural experience of the world and as a way to understand and support ongoing engagement. And one critical piece that she talks about here is again, these explanatory models of distress. So the same thing that's covered here in the cultural formulation interview in that first section, the importance of understanding what's, what's this family's understanding of, of what is going on. What is their model for what is happening to this child, why it's happening and what we need to do about it. And the idea here is that everybody experiences illness and distress and has expectations about what they want from providers and that those are gonna be shaped according to their beliefs. So we really wanna, again, spend time early on making sure that we understand from their perspective what has happened to them, what do they call their problems, how do they understand it. And the importance of explanatory models can't be understated. Um, it, it really gets us from that initial contact and that initial assessment to really be thinking about the next stage, which is providing effective treatment. That when we look at, at meta-analyses that have looked at culturally adapted psychotherapy treatments, that, that modifying this explanatory model, right, that really addressing how the family sees the problem tends to be one of the most important moderators of treatment outcome. That to the extent that culturally adapted interventions are more effective, that that's really because we're spending time adjusting and, and co-constructing what this thing is, what we call it and what we do about it. And that as we're doing this, we want to do it for the purpose of assessment, obviously, but we also want to uh, uh, communicate respect for the client's understanding of the problem. And that, and that to the extent that these are perfectly aligned, that's fantastic. We move on with treatment. But that most often, across all families of all types, these aren't going to be perfectly aligned explanations. And that then our goal is to really think about how we co-create an understanding of what this is working with the families, working with the youth, working with clinicians and other providers to say, how do we develop uh, and, and co-create an understanding of what this problem is? And especially challenging for, the, the, for those of us in the clinical child uh, and adolescent world, where we're really thinking about so many different perspectives to align, that we're not just talking about one provider and one client, that we're really talking about what's the system's perspective. What's the system's perspective on what this problem is and what we should do about it? And what do each caregiver, uh, uh, what's, their, what's each caregiver's understanding of the problem? And what about the child? How do they see the problem? And what about the clinician? And to the, for those of you that are trainees, what about the different supervisors in your lives? That often we're trying to really reconcile all of these perspectives and that to the extent that, that we can't reconcile them, that that's really setting us up for engagement barriers. And that it really requires for us to really be thinking uh, from the very uh, off, uh, onset of treatment for us to be thinking about 
how are we going to reconcile these perspectives as much as possible? I know many of you that have gone to a, a standard diversity trainings 101 have heard about the cultural iceberg before. Uh, so I'm not here to, 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 to uh, tell you something new in this respect. But one thing that's been really useful for me is to think about how, how this very simple concept where we think about um, cultural occurring at an observable level, where we think about these behaviors, things like language and appearance, but that often the parts we don't really think about are these deeper values below the surface, where we think about core values, where we think about interpretations that we make about the world. And where we think about the influences of families, educational systems, uh, history, religion, the media, that these basic understandings of culture and what it is really focus on thinking about how our experiences shape our beliefs about ourselves, about the world, and shape our interpretations of the world. And that that deeper level of culture is really what we're trying to get at as we become uh, more culturally responsive in our work. And the part that I like to highlight is that that's really what we care about as, as providers. We really care about what those interpretations and core values and underlying beliefs really are. That across most theoretical orientations or most ways of working clinically, that those are things that are really, really important. And the part that's, that's, um, that makes me optimistic is that these are really highly aligned with cultural responsiveness, right? That the things we already care about are already part of cultural responsiveness. Um, mostly, I work from a from a cognitive behavioral perspective, but from uh, if we think about what, whatever orientation you, you you tend to work from, um, that one of the really important next step is I think is for us to really think about integrating culture not just as a separate thing where we do an initial assessment and think about um, what is what is culturally relevant, but that we start to really move to think about how do we ingrain it within the ways we understand the problem itself, because that's what families are doing, right? Families are really developing this cultural understanding of the problem. And if our goal is to align our own perspectives with the family's perspectives, that we really need better ways to integrate cultural responsiveness into our um, the bread and butter of our work. So for me, that's a cognitive formulation. And what I've started to do is to really think about how we move from understanding history and current context, what's happening in somebody's daily life, and that that's an, a, a wonderful opportunity to think about historical events, to think about systemic issues, to think about current contexts. And to what extent are these daily experiences shaping somebody's beliefs about themselves and who they are in the world or other people or what the world is like, right? That that's a wonderful opportunity for us to really be responsive to culture as we think about the development of somebody's core beliefs. And the other place is to really think about intermediate beliefs, values, and attitudes. That a lot of the time, those are, those are, those that come from our, our cultures. Right? Things about what it's like to be respectful or whether you should go to bed angry or not, or whether it's okay to put your needs above somebody else's. That they don't have to be pathological beliefs necessarily, right? That those may be culturally informed uh, um, factors and that we, uh, by understanding them, create an opportunity for us to develop a much more crystal clear conceptualization of our clients, uh, um, uh, of our clients' concerns and how to help them. And that again, how somebody responds to distress and their coping strategies is also culturally informed. So that we often do something like this and think about from the perspective of obsessive compulsive disorder, from the perspective of depression, what might be relevant here, but that we can expand that perspective and I believe should expand that perspective to think about how is culture shaping uh, beliefs, whether adaptive or maladaptive. And another place I think about for um, just the basic state day to day interactions is when I'm working with somebody clinically, when I think about the application of a basic CBT model where we think about connecting automatic thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, that this is a place for us to also think about what are the situations? What are those things that have happened? And these are potentially are experiences of racism, experiences of discrimination, experiences of immigrant stress, that we also have an opportunity or a responsibility to be thinking about how these situations might be addressable before we get to challenging somebody's thoughts about those situations. And that if we're getting to challenging somebody's thoughts about those situations that we're really focused on the meaning, what's the underlying meaning of this? Why is this important to this parent? Why is this important to this, uh, to this child? So the good news for me is that we already again have many of these tools and the important part is for us to think about how does our professional culture start to integrate here? 
for us to be thinking about how am I being socialized professionally? Um, how does our theoretical orientation influence our worldview? And what does my way of working say about the relation and the role of culture? So I'll leave us with this last slide where we think about this folktale of the blind man and the elephant, where we're really thinking about, again, co-constructing meaning, but that for each of us really wanna make sure that we're developing and devoting that time to hearing stories, to developing that co-creation of a narrative, to make sure that we're understanding the same problem from a unified perspective. Um, and I believe I'm out of time, so I will, I will pause here for questions, but I'm happy to, to discuss further. <laughs>